Welcome to the Planning Commission's uh, workshop for August 24th. Uh, we're going to kick it off with a presentation from Sean College. Good, uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Sean College with Planning Commission staff. You should be seeing my PowerPoint, is that correct? Okay, great. So this is a workshop on coastal high hazard area issues. And I'll be doing a presentation and following me will be Brian Cook with Applied Sciences, who has worked with us on the county's co community vulnerability study and has other coastal and hazard, mitiga hazard mitigation projects in the area that he can talk about. So I'll start out. Sean, if I could just interrupt for one moment, you know, we want this to be informal. And so if you have questions, um, you know, feel free. That's the point of the workshop is for us to give you all some information, but also for you all to, to ask questions in a setting where we're not having to make a decision about anything in particular. So sorry. Thanks, Sean. Great. So a little bit of background, um, starting with uh, it's been over a century since a major hurricane has struck the Tampa Bay area. So it's not in anyone's living memory that what can happen when a major hurricane hits Tampa Bay. The last one was in 1921, um, and it was a category three, not even the most powerful hurricane. It did have sustained winds of 140 miles an hour. And this is a historic photo on your screen of the Hyde Park area, uh, the flooding aftermath of that storm that hit Tampa Bay just over 100 years ago. In 1935, the, a Labor Day hurricane caused major damage in the mid and upper Florida Keys. It remains the most powerful hurricane to hit the United States in recorded history. The winds up to 185 miles an hour. During that event, 408 people died in the Florida Keys. Now let's bring this a little closer to home and a little more modern now. Just three years ago in the Bahamas, just 70 miles off Florida's coast, Hurricane Dorian struck the Bahamas. The storm surge estimates there in some areas were more than 20 feet of water above ground in some areas. That's not just the first level of some buildings, but the second level as well. You weren't safe until you were on those third or higher levels of some buildings if the building could survive the uh, event. 74 people, at a minimum, at least 74 people were conform confirmed to have perished in that event. And that's, again, very close, just offshore of Florida, 70 miles away and just three years ago. Tampa Bay. It, this is a map of the storm surge for just a Category 1 event. If we had just a minimal Category 1 storm, the most minimal hurricane, these are the land areas that would be inundated with a storm surge if we have a direct hit under the worst case scenario. Draw your eye to some of the red on the very coastal areas. Red indicates a storm surge of potentially over nine feet above ground and other areas of three and six feet above ground in all the other colored areas. So it was still, even a category one would be a significant event. If a category three storm, or I should say not if, but when a category three storm hits, because it'll happen, it's just a matter of time. It could happen this year, it could happen 50 years from now. But if, a cat, when, if and when a Category 3 storm has a direct hit on Tampa Bay under the worst case storm surge, these are the areas that would be inundated. And again, areas in red are a storm surge more than nine feet above ground. So we're talking about town and country, much of the South Tampa Peninsula, Palm River, Gibsonton, Apollo Beach, significant flooding and other areas with flooding as well. This is an interesting graphic. It's going to be a before and after. This is provided by the Regional Planning Council. And the first photo is of downtown. This is, again, the same what I just showed you before, a Category 3 potential storm surge. This one adds about two to three inches of sea level rise, which we could expect through 2045. And the next photo is a visualization of what that event would look like in this area of downtown and West, West River. So it kind of hits home the water levels that could be expected in a storm surge. The last storm surge map I'll show you is the worst case scenario. This is a category five storm hitting Tampa Bay. Again, 
The red is greater than nine feet of, of storm surge above ground level. So we're talking about West Chase, Town and Country, all of the South Tampa Peninsula in its, in its entirety, Palm River, downtown Tampa, and Gibsonton, Riverview, Apollo Beach, all inundated over nine feet of water in a worst case scenario. It would be a very significant event for Hillsborough County in Tampa. All those areas also correspond to the evacuation zones. So anything with a color, the, these are the areas that have to be in, evacuated during these different levels of events. And if it's a category four or five storm headed our way, you're talking about almost all the, or all of the colored areas, all the people in those areas, residents will, would need to be evacuated. It's a significant evacuation population. Let's bring it back to coastal high hazard area. There are actually two terms. There's a federal term for coastal high hazard area. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has a coastal high hazard area definition associated with um, their flood insurance rate maps. That is sometimes confused with what we're more interested in is Florida statute. When we're talking about local comprehensive planning, we're really interested in Florida statute and what that tells us about what the coastal high hazard area is. Per Florida statute in our comprehensive planning, the coastal high hazard area is the area below the elevation of the category one storm surge line as established by the sea lake and overland surges from hurricanes, otherwise known as the acronym SLOSH, computerized storm surge model. Now that model is utilized in the regional hurricane evacuation study that is updated regularly and that is the area that I showed you previously as the Category 1 inundation area, and that is also, per state law, the coastal high hazard area. So when we talk about coastal high hazard area, we're, we're really only talking about the Category 1 storm risk area. We're not talking about the other areas that are at risk from a Category 2, 3, 4, and 5 storm. And, and as we know, those higher level storms do occur, and there's some some indication that the that the severity and intensity of these storms might be increasing over time due to climate change. Again, there's some other uh, areas of Florida statutes that are very act applicable. It says that our local plans must protect human life and limit public expenditure in areas that are subject to destruction by natural disaster. Florida statute also says, dictates that we have a level of service for evacuation. And if you're not grandfathered in, local governments, coastal governments have a level of service of 16 hours for a category five storm event. So the level of service is that if a category five storm event is coming our way, we should be able to get everyone out, that entire population I showed you in all the colors within 16 hours of announcing an evacuation. That is a very tall order and I'll show that to you shortly. Local comprehensive planning policy. I'll hit on a couple of the policies that we have regarding this subject. In the county, unincorporated Hillsborough County's comprehensive plan, we have a policy that says no plan amendment within the coastal hazard area that increases density will be approved that would exceed a 16 hour evacuation level of service for a category five storm unless the increase in density is mitigated. Um, that's an interesting subject because we're not sure it doesn't appear that there is a way or we haven't found a way to fully mitigate on a project by project basis for evacuation shelter space we have enough shelter space and shelter space is easily mitigated should we need it but alleviating the increase in evacuation when we're already at a deficit or even mitigating your own impact to evacuation on a project by project basis is a difficult subject and we're not sure it can really be accomplished. I have not seen an effective way of doing that yet. Another policy that's applicable is policy, flu policy 10.9, continues to implement measures to restrict and eliminate inappropriate and unsafe development in the coastal hazard area through plan designated uses, zoning, density, and intensity limitations. And the city of Tampa plan has a policy directing future population concentrations away from the coastal high hazard area so as to achieve a no net increase in overall residential density within the coastal high hazard area. That's a, a very good one in terms of the no net increase in overall residential density and kind of holding the line 
There has been some debate as to how to interpret that and uh, Tampa and the planning commission uh, staff is gonna be looking at that in the update of their plan. And another policy that's applicable from the city of Tampa's plan is limit new development in the coastal hazard area to uses that are vested or shown on the future land use map and defined in the urban design and land use elements. So again, it's, it suggests holding the line on the densities, intensity land uses that are in the plan or on the map now in the coastal high hazard area. Level of service, as I mentioned, per state law, Tampa has the default 16 hour level of service for Allen County evacuation. Hillsborough County was grandfathered in with a previous level of service of 28 hours. So, so um, Hillsborough County has over a day um, to get everyone out after announcing an evacuation. The most regional, reg the most recent regional evacuation study shows us what are the actual times that are that the model projected it would take us to get everyone out, and these are the times based on a 2020 scenario or a 2025 scenario. And at best, using the 2020 operational scenario, it estimates it would take 41.5 hours to get the population at risk that is expected to evacuate out, uh, which far exceeds the 28 and 16 hour evacuation level of service. So we're not meeting that level of service. I'm gonna bring this back now. This is my final slide. So what do we know? What does this tell us as a whole? Water is more deadly than wind in a hurricane event. Wind is horrible, it can blow roofs off, but it's moving storm surge water, it's rising flood waters that is really deadly and, and usually causes the most loss of life. We can't evacuate the at-risk population per the level of service that's in our comprehensive plants. We're not meeting that standard. And because we're not meeting that standard under this scenario, people could potentially be in their cars as the water rises. Uh, it's trapped in traffic, in bumper to bumper traffic, trying to get out during an event uh, as the storm surge occurs, and that would be a very bad situation. We can fortify buildings and we can build shelters. Of course, with the storm surges, it looks like even in some cases you need to be on the second or, or I'm sorry, the third or higher floors to be completely out of the range of the storm surge in certain areas. But the buildings can be fortified and shelters can be built. But the problem we have is we can't fully account for changing people's behavior. And if we add more people to the coastal hazard area, some percentage of that population, even though a shelter may be available or even though a, their building they live in may be fortified, they're gonna say, you know what? I'm getting out of here. I'm going to my parents' house in Orlando. And, it, and when that happens, they put themselves at risk because we can't get them out in time. And also their car adds to the congestion of the evacuation and makes congestion worse for the people who really do need to get out, who maybe aren't in a fortified building or don't have a, a, a shelter near them. So it's very problematic. We don't really, again, as I mentioned just before, we don't really have an effective way to mitigate for evacuation on a project by project basis. Um, building the shelters, fortifying the buildings um, doesn't account for truly changing their behavior 100% of the population and keeping them off the road. Um, unfortunately, some of them will choose to get on the road if we put them in that situation. And lastly, increasing land use density, therefore, in these evacuation zones can put them at risk because, you know, again, if they aren't able to go to a shelter, if they get in their car, uh, and we can't get them out in time, they're gonna be at risk if we've added those people to these hazardous areas. So something to consider. And um, that concludes my portion of the presentation. And next up is Mr. Brian Cook. Yeah, hello, um, let me see it. All right, got the cue to show my screen. All right, are you seeing the right screen there? Sean, give me yes, a sir. All right. All right. Well, um, yeah, thanks for having me. And um, here's a nice view of Davis Islands and the port, uh, just to begin things, um, looking at water around us. 
All right. So, um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, Sean and I have been talking about this a little bit um, just to help update and inform uh, you all. Uh, my name is Brian Cook. I was formerly with the USF Florida Center for Community Design and Research. And um, during that time, worked with Sean and a number of, I think some of you even, that uh, on, a, on a three or almost four year project um, with Hillsborough County to do the Hillsborough County Community Vulnerability Study, um, which uh, did a number of things and I'll share some, some examples from or some lessons learned from that study. Um, but yeah, I helped work on the comprehensive plan language to address perils of flood with that and um, and you know, work with the county overall and the planning commission. Um, also worked on the city of Tampa regulatory approach to sea level rise. Um, currently working on the city of Tampa climate action and equity plan with applied sciences now. Um, I'm no longer with USF, but I'm with applied sciences. Um, also working on the city of Tampa's coastal area action plan and also Pinellas County's uh, sustainability and resilience plan. So I've been working on these types of projects for a little while now and building up some experience. So I think that's why I was invited to um, just kind of participate and share and add some context to this conversation. So um, I just have a few slides to, to share some things that I've learned along the way. Um, I figured I would start with uh, just a little series of slides that I like to show um, just to kind of set the stage or put in context the history of living in say the, uh, the coastal high hazard area. Um, you know, our first inhabitants of the region were fairly smart. They lived in the area closest to water that was not impacted by storm surge. Most of it, mostly being in a safety harbor area and even Fort Brooke at the establishment of the city of Tampa um, was actually not in the coastal high hazard area, but very close to water. So very smart decisions in those days, at least with consideration of our environment and, um, and this kind of issue of coastal surge. And as time went by in the 20s, we had places like Davis Islands pop up, which sort of exchanged the risk factor for development opportunity and you know the beauty and enjoyment of living by water, which um, many over the years have, have traded that risk for opportunity. And um, so anyway, just to kind of give some context uh, to, to the history of development in our region. Um, with the coastal, or sorry, with the community vulnerability study, one of the main points, I'll just share a few main points from that, was really that um, historically we've, all, we've considered issues of the built environment quite a bit, but that also considering the people that live in uh, vulnerable areas or risk, uh, risk areas, <clears throat> that that's also something to be considered as well as environment. So, but really thinking about the people and the differentiation between people is something important when thinking about um, people living in vulnerable areas. And when thinking about risk, this was a, a diagram that we created through that study, was that risk is really these sort of compounding factors. People can live in a vulnerable area, let's say a hazard laden exposed area, and actually not have any risk. If you think about some of the old timers that live in the Keys, they've lived in the Keys for a long time, have lived with that risk and manage it quite well. Um, they have a lot of adaptive capacity in the way the homes are built and the way the people behave and their cultural connections. They are not that sensitive to say some of those larger storms. So really this became um, something to process um, a lot of what we were doing through is that risk is actually this compounding factor of hazards times the sensitivity to that hazard, and then also the adaptive capacity. And a lot of times the way you think of th thinking of that is either um, economically or physically um, being adaptive. So I'll share what that means maybe. Um, one of the maps we made with the community vulnerability study was looking at low income populations and their relationship. To, to coastal surge. So the map you're looking at was actually a projected 2045 storm surge map with the one, two, and or one, three, and five um, hurricanes modeled. 
Um, and you're seeing the larger circles are more low income populations. So we do have a few areas in Hillsborough County that have lower income populations near the coast. Um, so just something to consider that there's different resources, different adaptive capacity, both before and after events to consider um, the, the capacity to prepare for an event and also to respond to an event. Um, another thing that became interesting uh, through our study was thinking about, um, there's almost an expectation that everybody should evacuate. And actually we do have some populations in some of these uh, exposed area that uh, have kind of a high percentage population of that, that have a lack of vehicular access. It's concentrated in some areas, um, you can see, but also something to consider is that not everybody has a car. So um, anyway, another map there. Uh, another one was an issue, and this is sort of um, like a, a, in a, kind of an indicator. Um, we started thinking about things like hotels, really the services that, um, that are associated with emergency response and with different populations. One of the things with hotels is that's where a lot of people go to get out of, um, say, an evacuation area. And uh, in our region, we found that a large percentage of the hotels are actually close to shore, you know, enjoying the, the natural amenities, but that a large air, uh, percentage of our hotels and also commercial areas are in that, that kind of exposed risk laden area. Um, and I'll kind of share what that meant. Um, through the project, we developed some just kind of scenarios and studies and started to look at the, to think about emergency response as a system. And that, uh, say, going back to lack of vehicular access and thinking about hotels and all that, this project, for example, this was accomplished by students, but they were looking at other areas that could be potentially built up to, uh, uh, with increased density, with increased urban, or kind of increased urbanism that would, could be used as those back up spaces, places for people to go that are nearby, but out of a storm surge or a evacuation zone. So really the point here is to be thinking about the issue of evacuation of coastal high hazard uh, as a whole, not just as that area that's defined by that, that uh, coloring on the map, that it's a uh, we were taking a systems approach and trying to address it systematically um, other project i worked on was the regulatory approach to sea level rise with sea of tampa and just to share a few insights from that was re really there's um two types of policies there's sort of these one size fits all types of policies which um, can be defined either by fema or by the state um, where we sort of tend towards these, um, you know, like the coastal high hazard area is something that um, has policy address, say countywide, everywhere in the county right now, I think, um, is addressed uh, equally is in terms of it being in the coastal high hazard area. Then there's other policies that are more overlay zones or districts that are location-based. And that became something that we were talking about and considering, um, thinking about, and I'll show you what that looks like is with sea level rise, for example, um, it's, it affects different places differently. And so thinking about both the effect of the thing, the, the hazard that's in consideration, but also thinking about that idea of adaptive capacity, there's different communities along our coastlines and multiplying that all together, um, it may you know, just just as a as an idea or concept, um, uh, um, may bring about uh, some consider consideration about more localized um, policy making. Other recommendations I'll just go through was uh, what number one there is the establish the overlay zones, which I just talked about. Uh, number two is build toward the future. So one thing to think about is that we have a coastal high hazard area that is established by the current. Uh, slosh model, but you know people are buying homes with 30 year mortgages and, and one of the things that a lot of people are really starting to do is building towards the future and thinking about future conditions. So that's just something to consider. Um, identifying critical infrastructures and utilities and considering them differently. So maybe 
addressing those as a, uh, in a different way than other structures or parts of our urban environments. Um, promoting flexibility through landscape systems, uh, especially with sea level rise, um, but also with our storm events. Um, they're very unpredictable, all of these things. And so giving our urban spaces that flexibility is, is um, proved beneficial. Uh, develop economic support mechanisms for communities in vulnerable areas. This is really starting to take hold in some other places around the country where the funding of uh, of resilience and mitigation strategies is coming into question. And so localized, uh, say, tax districts or um, fee structures or something of that sort is being considered in way for as ways of uh, creating that economic capacity uh, in a more localized ways. Uh, education information as a recommendation and then plan or plan a coordinated city of the future. And that's really just that system based thinking. Um, thinking about that when we're planning or making policy for the coast, that it's important to also think about how that um, is related to areas inland. So that especially relates to things like um, climate gentrification or coastal development policy gentrification, things like that. So anyways, this idea of planning coordinated cities about taking those issues and wrapping them together um, to, uh, to, to create a cohesive policy. Uh, so that's that's what I have, and um, we're here, I guess, more for the conversation and uh, just trying to tease out some ideas here or, or give you some things to think about. Thank you, commissioners, for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Brian and I and Lisa are here to to talk to you about them. I'll, I'll let Commissioner Dennis, I'll let everybody go ahead first. I'll, I'll, I'll clean up, I'll back clean up. Okay. <laughs> hey guys, I'm, I'm clearly sitting here in the office with my assistant and partner, so we're in here. Um, really good information, uh, especially those, I think those, those maps really kind of made everybody sit back in their seat a little bit. Um, you know, my, my thoughts are, you know, as we at least, I know that I try to think about this stuff as we're making decisions and uh, looking at different things that are coming before us. Um, any specific insight on that and our thought process as you know, we have different things come before the commission when it comes to these types of things, uh, maybe things that are a little bit more out of the box that we wouldn't immediately think of? Well, I think one of the reasons that um, we wanted to have the workshop and the conversation was to because we're not only do we have to deal with decisions that you all have to make that are based on the adopted plan policies which sean discussed but we're also in the process of, of updating the plans and there may be opportunities to explore different policy approaches um, some of which brian discussed as we move forward um, i think we've all experienced in the review of some of the plan amendments, uh, some of the constraints, I think that's the right word, that the coastal high hazard area puts on, um, there was a, a plan amendment recently in the channel side area where it didn't used to be in the coastal high hazard area and now it is and the, the Channel side area very much is a, a place that Tampa's plan calls for redevelopment of higher density and intensity, but um, it was not something that staff felt based on the current plan policies we could support the increased density, even though, you know, that when I look out the window right here, I can see all that density that's happening, in, you know, down the street. So, um, I think that's kind of the, the, the but I think it, these are decisions that given what Sean and Brian shared cannot be taken lightly because we can't expect that everyone in the coastal hazard area is going to be able to evacuate. If they all try to, they're going to be stuck on the road um, and, uh, you know, and not everybody has a car to even attempt to evacuate. So there, there's, there's a lot of complexity to the issue. And that's why 
I don't know that I have an easy answer to your question, Commissioner Cardenas, um, but, but more that there's a lot of dimension to these decisions. And I don't know that it's a one size solution for all. Yeah, the I guess my thought, my second thought is, is we can't change what is current, right? We can't change the coastal high hazard area, but when it comes to exit plans, different things like that, is there routing options that we can suggest? Is there, you know, if you're in a certain area, is there a certain route that is, uh, you know, that maybe the sheriff or whoever did at that time as, hey, if you're in these areas, this is the route that's made for you. And then anything outside of that is separate. I'm just thinking outside of the box. Just... The way the way the um, the evacuation level of service is is it's applied um, by a jurisdiction. The modeling is done on a regional basis. So it, it's it's done. We know what happens in Hillsborough County to the population, but it also includes the movements coming out of Pinellas and such. Um, but but overall, that's that's the times for the population within Hillsborough County to get out of county, which is how the level of service is done. Um, so unfortunately, um, there's not really a way to make it better other than uh, have a transportation system that moves people faster, which I don't know is, you know, is a tall order. I have noticed in recent years more emphasis from the emergency management folks on not evacuating if you don't have to. For example, I live out in, in Brandon. There's, you know, no need for me to evacuate, you know, under any circumstance, really. Um, so uh, more messaging to residents in areas like that, that you don't you have to leave. Um, that sheltering in place is a very viable option. That's very I think true. It's related to building code. Um, so, for example, and directing the messaging, because if your house was built after 2002, you're in pretty good shape if you're not in the evacuation <laughs> zone. You're going to withstand the winds. But I don't know if everybody understands that. Um, so that's kind of another issue to consider. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, another dimension to this uh, is uh -huh. that that the older homes um, uh, are not built to the same wind standards. Yeah, we, we can build buildings. We have the ability and the technology and the engineering to build buildings that can survive the winds from a worst case scenario and that the water flowing under the building, we have breakaway walls that allows the storm surge to pass under. In some cases, it might have to be the first and second floor, um, not just the first floor. Um, so in, if you know that your your building is survivable and you're in an evacuation zone, then you could shelter in place. If um, what Melissa was describing in the in the hazard mitigation world is called a, a shadow evacuation. Um, it's the people who don't need to evacuate, but do anyway. Um, and and that, does, that congests the roads. Um, it's part of the congestion. Now they aren't now these mo this model that they're running it, it models all the all these behaviors, and we we um, they have assessed behavior from other hurricane events, and we estimate what people are going to do. It includes both a shadow evacuation that we don't want and we'd like to reduce or eliminate. It also includes um, the fact that some people who are in harm's way or not in a safe building will not evacuate, and that is what you saw in one of my slides where it had the base scenario. In the operational scenario, the base scenario is everybody that needs to leave leaves. Um, the operational scenario is everybody we think will leave leaves, but that's not everybody that needs to leave. That's only 80% or some percentage of the population, you know, that needs to leave. And it's it's um, it's scary because there's people that some people that need to leave won't leave. Um, but anyway, in any event, um, the modeling is for the population that we believe will be on the move and how to get them out in the amount of time that we're trying to get them out in. I just wanted to say, I, I think another way to help is to have more than one access point on subdivisions. I'm not sure about Hillsborough County, 
but I do know in Polk County, they can have over 200 homes and only have one access point. And we're talking cul-de-sacs mm -hmm. that block people in and they cannot get out because they've got the winding road and dead end cul-de-sacs all over and they're, they're trapped. They can't get out with only one access point. So having more than one or even a grid, people don't do grids anymore. And those are excellent ways to get the traffic moving. I mean, old towns have the grid system and cars get in and out. Um, we don't do that anymore. And I think those are helpful to move traffic is to go back to what we had before, which is the grid system and stop all of the dead end cul-de-sacs with 200, 250 homes with one entrance. Well, I had some, some thoughts. Um, there is the slide that shows the, um, I'm trying to pull it back up here, I'm trying to take pictures of it, but showing the, 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 I think there was one showing the, the greater density, you know, and where all that is in relation to like the coastal high hazard area. And I think Sean, you brought up a, a fact that w in one of the studies, one of the unknown variables is human behavior, you know, what people, you know, are going to do. Um, and that's always something that's just going to be, I don't think you can quantify that or, you know, with any sort of data. And what we can't quantify, you know, with data as it relates to people is where they want to live, you know, what areas, you know, do see them, you know, flock, where our cities are located. Um, and then it's pretty, you know, evident and apparent that at some point, you know, our desires shifted from being further inland to being like on the water and closer, you know, to the water. And that's where everything is built now, especially in, in our town and Miami, Sarasota and other places. So, you know, when I see, I, I don't know how we factor that in into our thought processes of decision making to develop, you know, into the coastal high hazard area. Um, and I know there's been some projects, you know, in the past, um, Melissa, you just touched on the one in, you know, downtown Tampa that all of a sudden it became a part of the coastal high hazard area and it ultimately, you know, was past our board. I don't know if that went through to uh, pass with city council, but there was another project that came up, you know, like in West Chase area that ultimately, you know, it didn't pass. Um, and that was, you know, it seems like we've made selective um, decision making on, okay, well, you know, city of Tampa, it gets all the really cool, nice, sexy stuff. So we're just going to continue to develop over here, but we're not going to afford the same opportunity, you know, for someone else who's wanting something of a lesser, denser, um, you know, development, you know, over, you know, in those areas. And there's clearly, you know, communities and people that have been living in that area and in those areas right on the water you know, for some time. So, you know, how do we give some thought into just you know, preference, you know, for, for where people be? I'm open for suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> how do you become live here? Oh, there we go. Um, Hi everybody. Thank you, uh, Sean and uh, um, Brian. Those are great presentations. Brian, good to see you. Um, yeah. I have a question. Do we have any data on the evacuation of Irma? Because I don't remember that really being a big deal. And, and if I remember correctly, I was forecasted as a four or five heading our way. I did. And I, I know I, I took in about 14 people from Pinellas County, friends uh, of mine. But I, I mean, I, we were watching football the day before. I think I feel like everybody had evacuated promptly. My. Well, I mean, I don't have a, we don't, I don't have a data on that. But if you're, there was some data specifically that you were looking for, I, mean, I could probably do some research. Yeah, just research. I mean, you know, what, what, were there any problems of acting? is really which is what I'm looking for um, just because there's a lot of emphasis on that when we're we're, we're in the right. uh, 
concessions that, you know, it's going to create more concessions. It's going to be harder to evacuate. And I'm just not, I'm not sure I've seen any issues, you well, know, in Tampa Bay anyway. Well, what I would say is um, we're not in a unique situation in Hillsborough County where we're not meeting our level of service. Most communities in the coast have that default 16 hour level of service. And, and, and just anecdotally, when we talk about it in the hazard mitigation world, most people are pretty much assume that almost probably all of the coastal communities can't meet that evacuation standard right now. Certainly the, the more developed counties um, are not, weren't developed in a way to meet that 16 hour evacuation level of service. So if, so if we're, if that's the, if that's the target, it's a difficult target. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it, again, it depends on the, the, the real problematic thing to think about is it depends on how early the emergency managers call the evacuation. Right. Because if they call it early enough and it gives people two days to get out, well, we have a 41 hour um, level of service. So 48 hours would meet our level of service. But what but the problem and that's that's operationally. If that occurs, we're gonna get everybody out. But the emergency managers, if you talk to them, they're in a dilemma. That if they call the evacuation too early and it does not hit and it moves, the storm moves, mm -hmm. they're, they're they're crying wolf. And then they're worried that next time people will say, Oh, well, evacuation is no big deal. I had to evacuate that time and nothing happened. Um, so they're in a dilemma. Do, do, if they wait for surety and only evacuate people when they know they have to, but then they're giving them less time to get out. Um, there is really no standard for when emergency managers call the evacuation. You know, it's their call. So we're kind of at, uh, you know, so this is what we're, what we're dealing with. They have that dilemma. We have the dilemma of the level of service, the standard that the state has set for us. Um, and, and this is where we are. Okay, so thank you. Because you know, I'm uh, asking you this because I want to sort of address what Cody was bringing up. We had two properties that I can remember anyway uh, in the last couple of months where the only thing, or if I it felt like the only thing stopping it was the coastal uh, stopping the recommendation of the commission was the coastal high hazard area. And you know, um, you'd mentioned uh, Brian mentioned you know uh, building buildings maybe the first second floor where they have the breakaway doors. And I, I was thinking of those properties, and I'm thinking the building on there now would be wiped out if we, you know, if we weren't allowed it to redevelop. So it's it's a policy with the commission that we can build something that can maybe handle a storm, but the building that's there now, you know, is going to get obliterated as a one-story building, not lifted at all. So I just think it's we have to look at those policies and see, you know, where. And I think I might have even said this: where does it make sense, or doesn't it make sense? And, you know, I don't even know how well they're following it anyway, because everywhere I look along the water, like Cody said, uh, things that we may reject are getting built anyway. Um, so I just think we have to look at the pol policy of the commission. Um, I'm not sure rejecting or or not recommending a redevelopment project solely on the CHAA. I think, you know, Commissioner Fernandez, I think your point is well taken in the situation where if the new construction is of a standard that is better, you know, is that a better thing? And and in that sense, I think you're right. It's a it's a it's a reasonable consideration. Now, the the counterpoint or the same thing to consider at the same time again is again is people's behavior though. If you put a hundred people into that building in the coastal hazard area and it's a safe building, if they all stay there, they're all safe. But how do we have reasonable mm -hmm. assurance? that five of them aren't going to say, I don't care, I'm getting in my car and I'm going to Orlando. So, you know, that's the dilemma is, is how do we have reasonable assurance that they're going to actually all stay in that building and not get on the road? And, and, and that's the, that would be detrimental if they got on the road. And I, I'm not sure how we reasonably assure that they're not going to. And if I could just touch on Commissioner Powell's comment, which was very well taken, and I'm not sure we fully addressed it for him, but in my in my sense, I would say, you know, we have to each local government and this is per Florida statute per Florida statute. Each local government does have the ability to set its own rules and regulations within these hazardous, hazardous areas. And it does have its own ability to accept what, what mitigation it deems is acceptable. 
So I think when we consider, um, as with anything or just about that comes before us, when we consider so a development in, in the city of Tampa or a development in unincorporated Hillsborough County, we have to look at the policies that those elected officials have adopted for their jurisdiction. And I touched on some of the most critical ones in the um, presentation that I had, but um, you know that's what the elected officials have, have said as their policy for those hazardous areas. And um, that's the evaluation that I think we should all be doing um, when we consider whether or not um, it makes sense for that jurisdiction or that unincorporated area. I think that's a good good point, Sean. That um, that there is, a, I mean, Commissioner Powell mentioned a project in Tampa versus a project in the unincorporated county. Well, they have different policy approaches, um, and that's the 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 confines in which you all make your recommendations is the the adopted consistency or inconsistency with the adopted comprehensive plans. Um, I did want to mention a question that Commissioner Kress wrote in. Commissioner uh, Kress asked, do you expect any state preemption related to plan updates in the coastal high hazard area? And I know there have been some changes in state law, but I don't know that they have been preemption oriented. Yeah, I, I, not, I have not seen anything, you know, I mean, the trend um, as, as our executive director and I have been working in this area for many years, the, the trend has been away from state um, mandates or regulation uh, in the in these hazardous areas and, and have left it more and more up to the local jurisdictions. As I just mentioned in my previous statement, the current Florida statutes gives great deference to local governments in terms of what they what they restrict in these areas and what they allow for mitigation even though when you think about it operationally um are we full uh, it's, it's unclear to me operationally whether we're fully truly fully mitigating for evacuation and um it, it's kind of weigh, weighing all these things and weighing whether we are potentially putting people's um health and welfare at risk um and and that's really the decision that has to be made individually per the policies in the plan. Brian had something to add. Yeah, I just I just maybe want to clarify um, one thing from a couple of the different comments. Um, one, there's a there's a difference between being able to build it all and which uh, is really governed by uh, the Florida Building Code and FEMA, like, you know, insurance and there's all these other regulations, but really Florida Building Code and that you real you can build in a coastal high hazard area. It's just how high you have to be and what kind of setbacks you have to have if you're like right on a coastline or something. But you can build in a coastal high hazard area, and and we have some of the most stringent rules from the state level for Florida Building Code. So then that's different than some of the rules that are more typically associated with coastal high hazard area, which are about um, density, critical infrastructures, um, and the expenditure of uh, public funds in those areas. I, I don't know, Sean, if that's a good summary, but I'd say those are top three. So um, the, the idea in a lot of places is to limit um, increased density from existing proposed densities that's in your future land use element. So you could even consider that in some areas, the future land use element hasn't even been built to full capacity. Um, and, and really the rules about density are there to keep from increasing density um, with a plan, with a PUD or some other kind of development. So um, maybe that's just, something to think about um the other thing is just um, i think it was commissioner powell talking about west chase and tampa i don't i i you know I'm, I'm sort of an outsider here but it would be interesting to think of what are the criteria that are being considered when thinking in tampa versus west chase because some of these things that we just went through in this last 50 minutes um there may be some of those criteria that are starting to define localized um, development standards or criteria for coastal high hazard area. Maybe it's association with economic value, maybe it's transportation, maybe it's uh, land use densities. 
So if it's more dense, then you want to kind of maintain that openness, or if it's really dense and clustered, you want to like build that up and build up the economic capacity of that area. So there are these kinds of things that maybe intuitively, or you know, I, I don't know what your process were that made those decisions, but it might be just good to backtrack and take note of those. And this is uh, Commissioner Bernstein. I, I was just going to weigh in real quick. And uh, Brian, thank you and Sean for that. But uh, thanks for m making that comment toward the end, Brian, because I sometimes lose sight of the fact that uh, a coastal high hazard declaration in of itself isn't necessarily a litmus test for development or a barrier. Um, but I, I, I kind of echo the sentiments of a lot of my fellow commissioners. We all are hitting at the same theme. And I feel it very acutely where the rubber meets the road is in these high density high rises for me because I catch myself sometimes uh, giving them more latitude maybe than I might a smaller dwelling or unit. And I agree with Commissioner Powell. It, it, I'm not necessarily looking at any guiding policy to judge me on this, but if it's in a, an area that's already not only dense, but closer to the water and fully developed like downtown Tampa, I might give that project the benefit of the doubt. And the irony to me is if I'm more inclined to tip my hat to a high density high rise that's in a coastal high hazard area, there seems to be a tension between that and the evacuation concerns you're raising. So, I mean, it really, it may not be realistic, but in a perfect world, it does seem like we could benefit from a, a core set of principles to guide us through these things when coastal high hazard inevitably pops up because it's going to a lot, look where we live, uh, as an area, usually a, a negative policy factor from the staff. And um, the longer we go through it, the more you're, you're at risk of seeing these arbitrary findings, or at least it looks that way, where half the time staff tells us it's coastal high hazard, we green light it half the time we don't and it's just hard to derive any guiding principles from it so i i'm probably just saying what commissioner cody and others have said but it's definitely it weighs on me uh, as these issues continue to come up let's hey. commissioner rodriguez um i like to weigh in here as as the mcdill representative we live and work in the coastal high hazard area and we have developed policies through the Air Force to, to mitigate as best we can. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Cardenas earlier said, well, we can't change the coastal high hazard area. Unfortunately, the FEMA flood maps changed last year, and they changed the coastal high hazard area on us. So, and generally making it, uh, you know, a more... Uh, more of an impact on the local communities than, than they were with the previous set of maps. So at McDill, we have policies to, uh, depending on the type of facility it is, uh, determines how many number of feet above the 100-year floodplain we build. All the infrastructure of those facilities are built outside of the floodplain. We have designed to flood areas along our coastline. Uh, we're doing to take those wave energies down as those waves are coming onto the land. So we're implementing a lot of these policies here at McDill. But I, I guess what I what I heard from, from Brian and Sean's presentation is we really haven't changed how we do evacuation planning or evacuation policy probably in the last 30 or 40 years here in the Tampa Bay area. And that's what really needs to change, folks. Um, we, we need more shelters inland in Hillsborough County. And we need to have a much better education program to tell our citizens, you don't have to drive to West Virginia when the hurricane comes. You just have to go inland about 10 miles, and we're going to have a place that you can ride that storm out. And as far as uh, the, the buildings that are in the coastal high hazard area, well, they're in an evacuation zone. And by policy, if you're in zone, if you're in the first evacuation zone, you got to get out. And I don't care how hard your building is you still need to leave that evacuation area. And that's part of, uh, you know, protecting life and limiting that public and private expense. 
uh, that building might be hardened, but those people aren't necessarily hardened. And they, they're the ones that need to go 10 miles inland. Go to that, go to that uh, evacuation shelter. So I think we need, as a community, and you know, the Regional Planning Council, they do the maps for each county. And I mean, this has been happening for my entire professional career here in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, you know, it's the same thing we do every year. And, and um, there's, there's just gotta be a, a, a better way of getting the people out of the danger zone without having them go 100 to 1,000 miles away to ride this thing out. And they just need to be educated uh, better with that. But uh, I, frankly, I do believe you can build in the coastal high hazard area because we have to do it. We have no other choice here at McDill. And I think buildings, if, if their infrastructure and their living spaces are raised up outside of that floodplain, out, outside of those flood zones, um, if, if they're designed with the breakaway walls in, in areas in those velocity zones, those buildings can withstand the storm. But we gotta still have that stringent policy that's, that's enforced by law enforcement when the evacuation order comes, that those people need to get out and, and get to those get to those evacuation shelters. But, uh, um, I, and I think if we had more shelters further, just a few miles inland, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have these clogged roads and, and we could get out and we have a better chance of making our, our 16 hour or our 28 hour evacuation goals. Thanks. I want to say yeah, I, agree I was on, with um, Commissioner Rodriguez because I'm a CFM and our goal is to pe get people out, not for them to stay. It doesn't matter how sturdy the house is because if it falls, who's going to go get them? The emergency people are risking their life because someone decided to stay. And that's not what they're out there for. As a CFM, we tell people they need to get out of there. And thank you, Commissioner Rodriguez, for bringing that up because our job is to save lives. And I wanted to add to that too. Um, Hillsborough County has done a fantastic job of planning where their shelters uh, are located. I just ran an analysis for the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council on evaluating the threat to the shelters when we factor in sea level rise and all the category storms. And Hillsborough County and Citrus County are the only two counties that none of their shelters were affected. So, uh, so we, we're, we're well prepared for that. And um, we also started looking at locations for new shelters. So they are, we, they are doing that. Um, that's in the process. So um, just wanted to bring that up. I'll go ahead and jump in here um, because <laughs> there's been a lot of great conversation going on on both sides of this thing so far. Um, Sean, I wanted to, to ask you to send me that TBRPC 2020 regional evacuation study. I want a copy of that for sure. And I probably want to do a meeting with you too to discuss this topic in general in a little more detail. Um, the core of my dissertation is vehicular evacuation here across the state of Florida. So I believe it was Commissioner Fernandez asked about Irma. I have data on every hurricane that's made landfall on the Florida Peninsula since 2010. OK, and I'm looking at traffic patterns from TTMS devices across the state before, during and after those hurricanes. This is a very sub a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, this is kind of why I didn't want to speak on it to begin with, because I would have hijacked the conversation into all this data and stuff that's not really important. But I think each of the points that everyone's brought up so far are very important. Um, from Commissioner you know, Powell's comments on the way we kind of make decisions you know, one way in one area and another way in another area, the, the discussions about the coastal high hazard area, um, even, you know, Commissioner Rodriguez's points about evacuation and the inconsistencies that exist in our various municipalities with evacuation, right? Before we even get to talking about being in the coastal high hazard area, that's a very germane point to discuss also. Um, I don't think I necessarily have anything more to add, like I said, because the conversation's been so broad and really, really good delving into all the points so far. But I would definitely like to speak to you some more about data points and some of the information we're showing, Sean, 
Um, I think we might be able to use, I guess, to throw add some good stuff in. We we could probably use some more information on actual flood inundation events here in the Gulf area, right? To find out what's going on in the Tampa Bay region instead of just looking at simulated models of what could happen. Let's look at what actual inundation levels have been in the past storms, and maybe we can start to understand what our real level of danger and exposure might be going forward. Um, the other thing that I thought was missing was information on, again, routing and roads, but the commissioners talked about that. The, you highlighted a lot of the things that were missing. Routing and roads, accessibility of routing and roads, authority over routing and roads, who controls routing and roads, is it the sheriff, is it the city of Tampa police? All these things sort of factor in. So for us to be just, just be talking about the coastal high hazard area without talking about all these other things in great detail, I think is a bit disingenuous. And I think it's our agency, our agency has that role to be bringing all these other things to light. So it, it makes me a little nervous that we're not talking about some pretty key things that have to do with the evacuation in coastal high hazard area. You mentioned shadow evacuation. There's also spontaneous evacuation. There's a, there's a whole gamut of types of evacuations and reentries that go on throughout the whole process. And I think that has to be spoken about too. If we're really gonna to get to some real decisions about what we're gonna be doing going forward with the coastal high hazard area. So I definitely like to have some more conversations with you as this thing moves forward. And that's it for me. I should, I should also <laughs> mention that I've, it, there were a couple of comments in the chat from Commissioner Saria about the issue of how evacuations occur and the incorporation of heart into that process, um, that it, it um, the conversation's gone a little bit more in the emergency management direction than I think we necessarily anticipated. It, um, for, Cause our role is typically more of a one of a policy approach but i i understand that understanding those details from emergency management um, are important to helping shape the policy so i think that might be something that um sean and i can talk about uh maybe a future workshop incorporating some of the emergency management folks to understand maybe after we'll wait till after hurricane season when they have a touch more time and less stress um, and um, and uh, you know set up a time to talk with them about um, their their roles in the process and, and how because I think some of the things about uh, communication and routing and um, utilization of the transit system are contemplated in their emergency management plans but that's not something you all are privy to right right now so we can get that in front of you all as well i think that would be good that's that's kind of why i didn't want to speak up earlier because it would have veered like you said way into some really deep emergency management stuff that isn't technically coastal high hazard policy stuff so yeah i mean it it, it all interrelates i mean just like a lot of things in planning they, they all they all uh uh intertwine with each other um, I, I think that, you know, one of the places I think uh, commissioner, a number of commissioners have said it, um, that, you know, we need to identify what the, the core set of principles are for how we're going to handle growth and development in the coastal high hazard area, and then be able to address that consistently. And, and that seems to be what you all are, are yearning for. And I think that's what, what staff would like to see as well. So I think that's a place for us to to move forward towards, um, and there's a lot of opportunity with the updates to the comprehensive plans. Um, uh, I'm going to respond to uh, Chairperson Joseph's comment about uh, existing inundation. That's one of the problems we have modeling the Tampa Bay area is we don't have too many storms, to, uh, you know, with data that, at least in the Bay. Um, I know. Uh, that tropical storm, Etta, really did a damage on shore acres and some parts of Pinellas, but didn't really touch South Tampa or anything like that. And, um, you know, related to that, uh, I've made a lot of these maps myself. Like I said earlier, I've worked for many municipalities on this topic. Um, one thing I think, uh, you know, Sean, Sean, you had mentioned in your presentation, we have to be careful to say um, when you show those maps, this is what's going to happen to Tampa Bay if a category in because storm surge 
really like a bathtub effect. It doesn't fill up the entire Tampa Bay. Um, we have to be careful. You know, you, the locations within these zones could, you know, be impacted by a Category Three because it, it just we don't want to lose uh, miss miss uh, misstate what we're what possibly could happen. I know it's your jobs to you know warn and and, and communicate the threat, but that's something I did a map for one of NASA on the Bahamas and you know that made the front page of the newspaper. And of course, what did it say? It said this is what will happen to the entire island of Nassau if a Category Four like that. And I was like, oh, I specifically said four times, this is the threat, you know, these are the p potential areas. So um, it's just difficult to, to map. And, you know, me and my colleagues, Brian, we've dealt with these things for years. So it's just, it's, it's tough. Yeah, those, those are the areas, your, your point is well taken. Those are the areas at risk. It doesn't mean that they're all going to be inundated to that level necessarily. It, it, it could impact different areas in different ways. You're absolutely correct. Um, I had another thing I just wanted to, to touch on. Um, sorry, I had to uh, go on my mobile here um, for picking up kids. But uh, whenever we are looking at these uh, studies, and, and Shawnee had brought up, um, there was a... a one of the studies as it relates to you know like transportation and 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 going off of that to kind of help us develop policy um and I, how does some of those factors play you know those studies you know play in to our planning when i have seen on a mul on several occasions when there have been you know developments that have come you know before us and we are no longer you know supposed to think about you know, traffic and level of service. And I mean, I've seen some uh, some very slick uh, presentations from transportation specialists and gurus and genies about, uh, you know, they're gonna put a new development on a, on a road such as maybe in, in the Bloomingdale area. And there's gonna be like a no net effect, you know, there and there's gonna be no added, um, you know, traffic when, you know, it, <laughs> you for sure know that there is actually going to be more added traffic. So, you know, how are we actually supposed to be able to digest that data here when we're not able to digest it in those situations? That That is a, that is a difficult thing. As you say, um, I've seen presentations where they talk about uh, a small development having a negligible or, you know, effect on traffic or that the road that it's going on to um, has capacity per, per se. And, you know, if this is in the, if this is in an evacuation zone, um, however, if, if it's an increase in density, I mean, I, I would, in my thought would tell me as a planner that it's adding trips to the road. And, uh, and we're in a situation where, you know, we're not meeting the level of service. Um, so um, that, that's the consideration that has to be made. And then you have to weigh that against the policies for the jurisdiction we're talking about. But it, it is, it is, it's a difficult thing. I'm not saying it's easy. <laughs> right, right. And, and, and I'm and just I pointing, just... Out. you know, we can't take those into consideration, but now we, are we, or do we have to start taking that into consideration when thinking about only the coastal high hazard? Can we think about traffic and, and level of service? Because, you know, we don't think about it or we're not supposed to think about it from a policy you know, standpoint, but it's kind of hard, you know, and just as a planner or just as um, just in general, you know, common sense, you know, tells you new development goes on a road, uh, there's going to be more traffic. So. You know, I, I, I've seen studies, and, and when it comes to, to that, you know, it's how evidence you know, can be presented. And, you know, you could make numbers say whatever you want them to say. I think Enron taught us that. So, you know, we have to you know, be cognizant of that. So I just wanted to add I that think, in. Yeah, there's a, there's a difference between um, transportation level of service on all roadways um, that is still evaluated, but the policy uh, framework related to stopping development because there is not adequate level of service on a specific roadway, that, that tool was removed from, from being able to be utilized in state law. Now, 
developers have to have the ability to pay their fair share of their impact and move forward even if the roadway is failing. That's um, that there is a little different, there is a very different policy framework as it relates to the coastal high hazard area. So that subset of the county and city um, is looked at differently and it's a but it's a different level of service. It's not the level of service of whether or not there's capacity on the roadway for everyday travel. It's is there capacity on the roadways countywide for evacuation. So um, it's a it's a different level of service that we are are still allowed to evaluate um, differently than we can the transportation level of service. So I think that's a that's a good distinction for um, that you're bringing up there, Commissioner Powell. Um, and I think I saw Brian or Tony, somebody maybe else wanted to talk. So maybe not. Uh, that's I might have had some time, but that's all right. I'm not able to hear you. I don't know if others can. Now, if, Tony, if you're talking to us, we don't hear you. We're not okay. hearing you, Tony. <laughs> now he's frozen. To let him know. I think he had a technical problem. His video wasn't coming in that way. Well. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Now. Um. Any other comments, questions, feedback? Oh, now he's moving again. Tony. I, I didn't want to say in the meantime to Commissioner Powell's point, um, I think that's kind of what Commissioner Fernandez and I were kind of alluding to there, Sean, when we were talking about, you know, being, I guess, open, right, and being upfront with the information, the, the visualizations and the data that you're showing, making sure that, you know, when you're, you're showing people things, they understand that these are models and simulations. And even going as far as even though there's not a lot of a lot of data showing show what little data there is, you know, that compares to the simulations. So that way people have a full understanding of what's there. You know, and I mean, I think things like that tend to go a long way in creating openness. Right. So that there aren't these kinds of questions and dark areas and the analysis and the data. And I, you know, we can't control that from the people who come for us. Commissioner Powell, but as much as possible, we definitely would like to make sure that staff, you know, our agency is always putting out data and information that's open and completely accessible to all the people who are looking at it. So we're not trying to, you know, keep certain things in the dark or, you know, bias things to look a certain way, right? We want to just put it out there open, clean. It is what it is. This is the data. This is what's going on. You know, and the community can make honest decisions from that. So I just wanted to mention that to Commissioner Powell's point. I don't know if you're able to hear us, but we couldn't hear you when you were talking before. Okay, let's try this again. Can oh, you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right. Um, my point was, as commissioners, we kind of wear two hats. We have this quasi-judicial hat that we wear during our public hearings. And with that, basically, we're just making the call whether the plan the proposal is consistent or inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. But now, as we do the plan formulation stage, these discussions like we're having here and that we'll have on the dais with staff as we formulate these chapters, this gives us the opportunity to delve into the transportation policy or any of the other policies, because with that, we can have input into what's in the plan. So that's, that's how we get 
our desires into the plan because once the plan is set and adopted, we're just making the call as to whether or not it, the proposal is consistent with the plan. So this is our time to make our mark on the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Very well said. <laughs> Very well said. A lot of good comments in this workshop. We got the genie comment. Commissioner Rodriguez is on a roll over there. I'm liking it. I'm liking it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this is good. Um, well, we've taken a little bit more than the hour we had scheduled. So, um, but it sounds like this is a topic that you all are very engaged in. And so, we'll, we'll Sean and I will put our heads together on a, a part two, maybe coming up here in the future. Um, and really appreciate. Brian, you joining us and sharing the, your insights and information is very helpful. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, if there's nothing else, um, thank you all very much. Have a good afternoon. All right, have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. <laughs>